Yep. Thank you. Got it. The, sh um, the chauffeur gives his talk, but the, uh, someone asks a question from the audience and he says, oh, this is such an easy question. Even my chauffeur sitting back there in, uh, in this room can answer your question. So I will say the same thing, that if I don't know the answer, there's somebody back there who can answer the questions that you may have on Dizzy Gillespie or Baha'i. Um, I want to also mention uh, in my before I um, begin um, is to name I, I don't know how many people are are here who are not familiar with Baha'i uh, members or Baha'i names, but I will recite them so that later on you will become um, you, you know you you will not be so confused. Um, the name Beth McKenty is the one who introduced the Baha'i faith to Dizzy Gillespie in, uh, uh, in 1966. Um, there are, in Baha'is, there's no clergy, there's no preachers there's, uh, uh, of this kind, but there are special uh, Baha'is who were appointed as hands of the cause for teaching and propagation of the faith, protection of the faith. And these were, um, about 29 of them at different period were appointed by the, the head of the Baha'i uh, institution. And uh, so at the time when Dizzy uh, was searching for Baha'i information on Baha'i, there were two hands of the cause in Los Angeles at that time. One was Mr. Bill Sears, who was hands of the cause from, uh, and the second was, was Mr. Um, Samandari, Tarazullah Samandari. Mr. Samandari, his unique um, uh, position at the time when he came to Los Angeles in 1968, he was um, he, he, at the, uh, the um, age in his youth, he had met Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith. And uh, I, I hate to say the word founder, he was the manifestation of God for that, for this age. The founder means, oh, I, you know, I discovered this. No, he was the manifestation of God in this day, age. So Mr. Uh, Samandari was one of the first or one of the only person in the Baha'i community who had, uh, who had met Baha'u'llah and had been with him at the time of his, when Baha'u'llah uh, lived in, in Haifa, Israel. So at the time in 1968, Mr. Samandari came to United States to visit and um, give talk at different locations, including in Chicago, Alaska, Washington state. And then he came to Los Angeles. He had a pneumonia in Alaska, he got a pneumonia. And so instead of staying for about a week, he stayed for about three or four weeks, but he was a giant. He was a little bitty man. And I think there is, I, maybe I, I, um, I thought I had sent a picture of him, but I guess I did not. But he was a very petite man, but always dressed <laughs> very, very warmly, one after on top of the other, a jacket or coat, etc. cetera. And, uh, but he would, as soon as somebody would come to hear about the faith, the youth would gather, um, he was always up and giving a talk and you would never think that this man was close to 90 years of age. He was like a giant, a real giant. He was just, a, um, he, he, when he spoke and sometimes, you know, in those days, microphones and things did not work, but he would, he, he, he would sometimes push the <laughs> microphone that, you know, sometimes when he says, I don't need the microphone and you could hear him all the way to the end of the, the ballroom or, or uh, wherever he was speaking. Anyway, so that's, um, and then my, uh, my research in uh, finding a little bit about Dizzy Gillespie, which I didn't know much about him, except the fact that he became a Baha'i in our home. Uh, I, uh, I wanted to know a little bit more because the, the writings about him was a little conflicting. So I met several people 
Um, one was the Daniel, uh, Danny, uh, Stan and Danny, uh, Danielle Shelton from Palm Springs. They're living there now. And uh, uh, Dorothy Longo, his, uh, her uh, husband, was a, a piano player for Dizzy Gillespie for seven years and very close friends. And they both became Baha'i very close to each other's time. And I wanna also say that uh, Susan Engel uh, and uh, Lutando Mazbiku, who could not be here with us, uh, they have written these little books for, uh, for the youth called uh, John Berkey Dizzy Gillespie, a, a Man, a Trumpet, and a Journey to Biba. And it's, it's a, you know, it's a book for the youth that um, was also, there was, uh, I, you know, I was able to read it very quickly. And then there were two other books that I, uh, I uh, followed to make sure that my information matched what was written to what I witnessed myself. And um, the one that uh, was written also uh, was by uh, uh, Dizzy Gillespie and another author. And uh, those books are called um, uh, let's see, uh, it's, uh, it's right here by my side and I've written it here. It's called To Be or Not, To Be Bop, B-O-P. And, um, and, uh, and that was by Dizzy and, and Fraser, I believe it was, yeah, Fraser. And the other one is John Burke Gillespie by Donald Maggins. And he, this is a real good book. I am highly recommend it because it's well-written and it is, uh, it is very detailed. But if you're, if you're into music and you wanna know the name of different people who were in, the, in the Dizzy's uh, concerts, et cetera, those are the two wonderful, wonderful books. I wanna recite a poem that was sent to me a couple of days ago. Don't write your name on sand, waves will wash it away. Don't write your name in the sky, wind may blow it away. Write your name in hearts of people you come in touch with. That's where it will stay. My curiosity about uh, Dizzy caused me to research and interview lots of different people. Today, I'm covering his story. Dizzy in his book, To Be or Not To Bop, says there must be another reason for living. Now is the time if you're talking about a quest in life, I had to find out what the reason was and go about it better. Because when you die and come back, I was, a, I, I was gifted by the supreme being in having a unique talent for which I'm very grateful. If God gives you, uh, gives a guy a talent, he should use it. If you don't use it, it is sin, it is, will be taken away. And if you have this talent, you must give something for it. It showed to show appreciation. Baha'u law says that work done in the spirit of service is the highest form of uh, worship. Baha'u law emphasizes that every person to learn and practice their trade, it is enjoined upon every one of you to engage in some form of occupation, such as craft, trades, and the like. We have graciously, Baha'u law says, exalted your engagement in such work to work of worship unto God, the true one. The reason I'm speaking about Dizzy is that I want each of you in this audience to think how and why the life of a man who was born and raised with hardship, discrimination, lack of food, starvation can find you know, I'm going to cry now, can find peace in his heart, become successful in his profession, musical, jazz, in style not well known and difficult to understand. How a person like Dizzy overcome difficulties in all conditions and surpass and take a harder, not well-traveled road to reach the destiny of, excuse me, to reach the destiny that God has placed before his creator. Dizzy in his time of great success 
was more in pain than in beating and whipping he received from his father in his childhood. And the reason his father would whip him every Sunday, he would, you know, he was uh, 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 the ninth of the ch nine children. They had the, uh, Dizzy was the ninth child. But every Sunday he would whip all the sons really hard and very mean and cruelly. And the reason he did that was that they become hard and they become um, uh, 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 familiar to hardship. And so this is what his father was trying to, to teach to his children by whipping them. He received from his father, and it was in the 60s where Martin Luther King was assassinated, where the black youth were prevented from entering colleges, where the leaders of the nations running for offices of presidency could not make a decision whether to help the black movement or let the mob and local police take over beating and killing their fellow neighbors due to their skin colors. All these was hard to accept by Dizzy. In addition, he lost one of his best friend, Charlie Parker, who you saw him performing with him, to heroin. Charlie Parker was a saxophone player in Dizzy's orchestra, a talented man, Gillespie and Charlie Parker were saying that the other other was half of his heart, who was addicted cocaine and to alcohol and cocaine. Dizzy loved all people. He had become successful in bebop jazz musician. His music was played all over the world. If you could uh, show the first picture of, of, uh, of Dizzy and uh, Charlie, I would really appreciate it. John Burke Dizzy, known as Dizzy, was born in October 1917. This is at the same time that Abdul Baha was present and he had come in this country in 1912, but in 1917 he was alive in, in back in Akka and Haifa. Growing up in poverty and lived in a strict segregated condition in uh, Chira, South Carolina, he was the last of the nine brothers and sisters. Father had two jobs as a brick mason and musician in the evening, but cruelty on the children where he would whip them, whip the boys every Sunday, as I said, to make them stand harsh conditions. Father died when Dizzy was only nine years of age and mother had to work as a laundry and cleaning home for white people. The town was not friendly to white and black children playing together, but there was a fight between them, Dizzy had a punch hand, punchy hand to have the white kids flee for, for their lives. He saw himself no different than anyone else. His skin color did not prevent him from doing his music. As later he had, he had his own little band and the white kids would invite the bands to play in their school dance, etc. He was accepted in uh, Lorenberg Technical Schools and at that time, his students and, and trumpet players uh, were needed and the scholarship was offered to him for his tuition, books, foods, and, and, and uh, a dorm, et cetera. The racial issue in this country from slavery to segregation, in my view, was harsher on the community. The dark skin color were deterred from employment and, and civic jobs. So those were the reason that white could continue to subject the dark skin color with domestic and farm work only. Chira was, uh, I think I'm pronouncing it cor uh, correctly, Chira was mostly cotton growing area. Children were subjected to picking cotton and separating the cotton from the husk with raw hands. John, after a few days of picking, um, got sick in the cotton field because it was chemical sp uh, spray in the field and his hand was too raw from removing the cotton from the thorny husk. He was fearless person because he loved all people and did not pay attention to their skin color even though his mother worked for a white woman who had son as John's, uh, 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 who was working for a white woman who had a son at John's age. While mother was working, the two children would play. One day, each of their mother privately told their sons not to see each other anymore and they could not play anymore. 
this was difficult for the boys to understand. But you know what? How life changes. But later in life, they were able to unite when Dizzy was performing at a club. The man bald headed comes to Dizzy after his performance and shakes his hand and tells him that he was the boyhood friend. The boyhood friend who could not play with him. When they were children, Dizzy remembered him as they continued their friendship. Dizzy was interested in music from childhood. He was known as a mischief maker, and that's how he got his name, Dizzy. <laughs> he was always making pranks and horseplay during the rehearsal with other performers. During one of the rehearsals, he was playing different tune than the other young performers. His teacher, conductor says, he that he was dizzy with his tune because he did not jive with the rest of the performers in performing to tune. You know, I was thinking when I was doing this research, I said, you know, dizzy in Persian means diz, you know, play, uh, clay pot, dizzy, if you pronounce it just a little twist to that dizzy. And, and so, what does that pot do? You put everything, meat and vegetables and potatoes and everything else in there and you make the most delicious soup. So that's called dizzy <laughs> in here. <laughs> so this is, you know, when you speak two different languages, you interpret everything differently as well. <laughs> um, there was a time where the band was performing in the South. At the airport, let's see if I, um, <clears throat> this is about the discrimination that he, he had to face in different places, even when he became famous. There was a time where the band was performing in the South. At the airport on their return to New York, suddenly there were several police questioning Dizzy about his disper uh, disturbance at the ticket counter. The rest of the band did not want to get involved, so they pulled themselves to the side. But Dizzy was interviewed by the police. When they asked him where he was from, he did not say he was from New York, that he was from Cheryl, South Carolina, to soften up the angry behavior towards him. The man at the ticket counter refused to check the men in for the flight until all the white people were first checked in. This did not jive with Dizzy for himself or for his band members. In fact, another time they were in, um, uh, in uh, another uh, country in South America where the hotel refused to have the black people to, to the, the, the band and people to, uh, to, uh, um, to uh, uh, get a room. And so they decided that they would go to another but this got in the paper, et cetera, and the president of that country apologized profusely to him and to the State Department for, for uh, this behavior. But, you know, he taught, in, in, wherever he, he, he was, he taught his, his band members, and, and whether they were white or, or skin color, Spanish or whatever, that they were all united. In fact, one of the the band, in fact, later uh, would be played, is that he called it United Nation Band. And uh, because he had the music of the different uh, countries. In Brazil, he realized no negative forces to hold you back and because you are black. He noticed Sepel, uh, Sepel, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, Sepel, a black man was the chief uh, arranger at the TV station studio. He is there because he's qualified, uh, Dizzy says. If a guy is qualified down there, he can go on up. In Brazil, he learned that jazz music and samba was great together. He realized unity through diversity in music as explained without losing its diversity. In music as in Baha'i faith teaches me about life and he says, in Baha'i faith, we don't believe in cutting loose anything good. Cut loose your heritage. Baha'i believes that you bring in, you bring it and work with others. Bring it into whole, just like a master painting, because 
I am purple and there's another cat who is a red, orange, uh, doesn't mean that we cannot come into the big uh, uh, compatible com complementary arrangements. As you know, during the time when they, they were working in the, in the farm or in the field, I should say, um, and the white people would not allow drumming uh, by the black people because they felt that the drumming was communication from one group to another farm or another uh, field. And they, they did not allow any drumming during the time, um, uh, you know, uh, the workers were in the field. <laughs> in fact, there was an early Amer uh, uh, English Baha'i, I forget his name right now, but God bless his soul. He was in America and was working as a supervisor in a field, cotton field. And he, go, he becomes a Baha'i and he goes on a pilgrimage to uh, where Abdul Baha uh, tells him. And he, he, he tells his pain about these children being used so harshly in the, in the cotton uh, picking fields. And Abdul Baha tells him to write his resignation right away. And there's a beautiful, beautiful prayer Abdul Baha revealed in honor of, uh, isn't, isn't that funny? I can't, uh, right now I'm thinking about this talk and so I can't remember his name, but the, uh, one of you will remember it later and tell me this. But this is uh, almost the same period. Um, in um, Brazil, there was a well-known uh, uh, Brazilian, uh, a queen of Brazilian jazz performer, singer, and her name was Flora Purim, Purim known as the queen of the Brazil, uh, Brazilian jazz, was traveling to Australia for a concert to perform with Dizzy. They were sitting next to each other on the plane. He takes out his prayer book out of the pocket and gives it to her. Yeah, you know, I haven't, I'm going to uh, give you the information about how he became a Baha'i a little later. So this is, you have to wait <laughs> until that time. <laughs> so he, he has, at this time, he, of course, he was a Baha'i and he takes out a prayer book and, uh, and he gives it to her. They were sitting next to each other. And uh, she says, uh, well, how are you going to uh, say your prayer? He says, well, you open up one page and I'll, I'll recite it for you. And sure enough, he was a brilliant, brilliant man. And his English was excellent. And his memory was just quite marvelous. He would remember the name of every one of his performers or the name of this and that. Uh, of people who were, who were performing with him or other people. He just, in fact, if you see his interview on YouTube, you will see how he, he just like, as if somebody had these names right in front of his eyes. He, that's how, how smart and intelligent he was. Becoming a Baha'i is a problem. Racial discrimination in this country and alcohol. But he understood his role as a Baha'i and gradually came to realize the importance of his spiritual growth and enrichment there is a higher power through prayer and meditation, turning to God, the all-knowing physician, the whole loss is, hath his finger on the pulse of mankind. He perceiveth the disease and prescribeth in his unerring wisdom, the remedy. Every age has its own problem and every soul is particular aspiration. The remedy the world needeth in this present day affliction can never be the same as that which is the subsequent age may require. Be, anxiety, be anxiously concerned with the need of the age you live in and center your uh, deliberation on it, on its ex exigencies and requirements. This is from the Tabernacle of Unity, page 18, 19. Um, well, a couple more things. As you may know, he was honored at, um, by President uh, uh, Eisenhower, Nixon, Ford, and, uh, and uh, Carter. 
Carter was a, uh, a, also a jazz buff. And so uh, he received a special invitation at the White House by the President Carter, who also had as his guest, the Shah of Iran and his wife, Farah. He was recipient of many more recognition for his music and for his good nature as an, uh, a unifier of the people, whether he was of Europe, Sir, uh, South America, Africa, Middle East, the countries he was in. If you could show some of the pictures Let me see, I had it in order. Sorry, we're, uh, we're losing you there for a minute. Oh, really? Again? Yeah, uh, that's all right, though. Which, uh, which image did you want? I wanted to, when he was in Pakistan, uh, and uh, he's, uh, he's uh, doing the, let me see. Uh, OK, oh, excuse me. Uh, the number five. Night, one moment. Thank you. There you are. So he's performing for the snake and the snake <laughs> pops his head out. And uh, he was in uh, uh, another place riding the camel number four. And uh, so um, then uh, at the Carnegie Hall, there was always abundance. I mean, always, always just let me. The audience was just riveting over his, his music. His, it was very hard for uh, bebop to get started. It was very difficult because people were not used to bebop. Bebop is you sit down and listen. Whereas um, the other musics before, it was just you tap your, your, your feet and you dance with it. So going back to uh, uh, because of Martin Luther King and because of his friends, uh, Charlie Parker died, he was extremely depressed. There was also riots in this country and lack of support by the policymakers. <clears throat> so when he's in Milwaukee and he uh, received a telephone call in his hotel by a woman by the name of Beth McKenty, as I said, she was a Baha'i. She had been in a bookstore and read about Charlie Parker. And Charlie Parker had said that, that Dizzy was his other, um, uh, you know, he was his, his other half. He loved him so much and they had performed so much together and that they were like brothers. So anyway, she reads this book and she thought, well, she has to get hold of, of uh, uh, dizzy and uh, she when she calls him she says uh, uh, she says uh, could I come over uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I have read about this book uh, about Char uh, Charlie uh, Parker and I don't uh, and I, uh, I want to discuss the book and uh, Dizzy, of course, with his, you know, humor as well as kindness and everything. He says, no, madam, I don't want to, no strange woman coming over to my hotel. No, no way. But she says, then she, you know, she gets herself together. <laughs> well, my husband and I, Jack McKenty, Dr. Jack McKenty, will be in the club tonight. So he was performing, of course, and she's, she and her husband came to the club and they didn't say anything about Baha'i according to Dizzy. They just talked about Charlie Parker because she thought, she told him that if, if he, and somebody had told Charlie Parker about Baha'i, he, he it, it could have saved him, Baha'i could have saved him. Now, I was thinking why become a Baha'i? It is a recent revelation of God for humanity. It is guidance for humanity for survival and to bring about unity of all people, no matter of color, nationality, or culture. 
It is a framework for unity through diversity. It is a way of life that one has personal connection directly with the creator. It is directing guide, uh, direction guided by reading and uh, immersing oneself to become noble and higher being. Each person is responsible to seek guidance without the need of clergies and intermediators. In the Baha'is, there is no clergy. But in the age we are to be guided, in, in this age, we are to be guided and by uh, guide, to guide ourselves by reaching out our destiny to serve humanity, to serve the loftiness and, kind, and kindness, to ensure the protection of oneself, family and society as a whole. It is an organic life cycle from rebirth, from pre-birth to death of life beyond here and now. One has only been given a choice in this life. This is the, where we can make it and choose whatever, but not the one that comes before or after this existence. How do you personally assess your daily life and how do you make yourself a better person? You know, in this day and age, I was reading a book about doctors and pharmaceutical companies making our lives dependent on drugs for our uh, depression, anxiety, and fear. The less we are connected to our own spirit and God, the more we become dependent on substance, substances and worship idols. This is where people in all levels and all ages are drug addicted and dependency become, uh, has become so, so rampant. We have not learned to face the difficult task but to escape them, push them aside. Prescription and street drugs ad addiction have caused death over 100,000 uh, uh, people last year. According to the uh, Briggs, the, the, uh, the book that I uh, said that he has written, teaching uh, of Baha'i, it restrict, uh, it, uh, Baha'i teaching adheres to a strict family and social uh, oriented moral code. The laws are progressive according to the needs of the time. It was given to humanity late in 1870 to protect humanity from destruction and calamity as we are now faced with. So now I wanted to say how Dizzy, <laughs> Dizzy was staying at the home of Bob and, uh, and uh, Keith quickly who were producers of uh, television um, um, game shows, et cetera. And uh, in fact, there's a book, you know, he's called The Father of the Game Show. This is way back in the 50s. Uh, Mr. Sears and, and uh, Dizzy, when he was in town, he stayed there. And um, Dizzy always used to connect with the Baha'is when he came to, uh, to any town, but it was Los Angeles. And uh, I want to say that when he came to Los Angeles, uh, he would call upon Stan and Danielle to, um, uh, uh, to give him right and basically to anywhere he wanted to go. But on that day, um, there was um, uh, Georgia Sanchez, um, Keith and Bob Quigley's were going to a restaurant which was very famous called the, the Brown Derby. In fact, if you have watched Lucille Ball, she's, you know, gawking over to see which, which uh, movie star is sitting in that, uh, <laughs> in, that, in that restaurant. But anyway, it was very famous and I remember it was just really quite lovely. But as we were going there, Pardon me. Let me just ask you to pause just for a second. We just need your uh, your microphone to catch up with you. Am I talking too fast? <laughs> nope, you're good. Just had a momentary blip there. You're back. All right. Thank you. So Georgia says, 
you know, Mr. Samandari is staying at the Subhani's house. This is my family, my mother and my brother's house in Van Nuys, California. And Mr. Samandari who met Baha'u'llah, he can answer all your questions about Baha'i and whatever you want to know. At this time, he had not, he was, he had not declared himself, although he had read Thief in the Night and different books about Baha'i and the revelation of Baha'u'llah, not revelation of Baha'u'llah, but Thief in the Night speaks about the, 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 the subject refers to the Bible scriptures uh, of the reference to the time of the revelation of Baha'u'llah and the Bab the forerunner. So he had read that already. So, but he still has some, uh, some question. And so uh, Georgia says, um, so they, instead of going to Brown Derby, they come to our house, my mother's house. And they said, you know, my mother was very well uh, <laughs> known for her making uh, bread, uh, Persian, uh, Nana's bread, we, we was called. She says, well, she always have rice and bread and everything else. We can go over there and have lunch and maybe meet uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Samandari. Uh, so they drive to Van Nuys, which is about maybe 15 miles from uh, Beverly Hills. And, uh, and uh, they sit at the dining room table but this is a, a Mr. Samandari. Uh, this is asked some questions, and so Mr. Samandari takes him to uh, his room. With he, he had a translator, Mr. Uh, uh, Doctor um, Doctor Samandari from uh, South Africa, who had come as his he was his son as a translator for Mr. Samandari. So um, so the three of them go into room, and after two hours of questioning about all these issues that trouble Dizzy, especially about this unity and the issue of black people in this country. He was just really troubled with them with that. And uh, so Mr. Samandari, hand of the cause, answers each and every one of his questions. After about two hours, they come, Mr. Samandari is holding his hand and Dizzy's hand, and Dizzy goes with the other hand. I am a Baha'i, sign his card. I want to become a Baha'i. Now, it is very interesting. Some of the, the, the uh, books that have been uh, written, and they say different things that Mr. Sears uh, saw. No, it's not that. It was Mr. Samandari who witnessed the, uh, the uh, registration and also the fact that he became at, a high, at, at our house, I could say. So, and then of course, Mr. Uh, Gillespie, many times we need, we were building the Baha'i Center, or redoing the Baha'i Center in Los Angeles. It was a bowling alley. And so to make it into uh, uh, auditoriums, so we asked him if he could, <laughs> help us, he brought his whole concert people to perform and we raised the money, always, always. And then I said, Dizzy, would you puff your cheeks a little bit for me? And he goes like this. And he, so he lets me, let me push into his cheek. And so, anyway, I want to, uh, you know, I think I have taken too long with this talk. Uh, but that's how it happened. That's how Mr. Uh, Gillespie became a Baha'i. And then what happened was this card was taken to Mr. Sears and the good news was shared with him at the home of Keith and, and uh, Bob and Keith quickly. And then two days later, Stan comes to the house to pick up uh, dizzy to take him to a home of a Baha'i uh, and uh, and uh, then Keith gives, says to Stan would you take this to your assembly which is in, what was in Long Beach and the Long Beach Baha'i assembly sign or co-sign his card and it is recorded in fact I verified it 
at the National Spiritual Assembly record that it was the, um, as the spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of, of um, uh, uh, Redondo Beach that co-signed Dizzy Gillespie's. So I'm making the record straight. <laughs> Yeah, but I do want to say this. Dizzy died on January 5th, 1993. And on uh, January 12th, uh, Megan's uh, says, 6,000 people filled every corner of the St. John Auditorium longer than a football field were there to honor Dizzy's in spite of rain, sleet, gust coming in over the Hudson that drove the wind chill down into the 20s. This is music rain during the more than two hours of three hours of service. Many musicians and clergy and Judge, Judge James Nelson from the Baha'is representative spoke about Dizzy's life and at the celebration of his mission accomplished life. The Universal House of Justice sent the message that was read at the service and I will recite it for you. We share great sorrow at the, let me make this a little bit larger for me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is, uh, was written on January 7th, 1993, Universal House of Justice that is, uh, in Haifa, Israel, their headquarter, has written to his wife. We share your great sorrow at the passing of de dearly loved, highly cherished John Burke Gillespie, who steadfast in the cause of Baha'u'llah and con constant promotion of his teaching added a luminous quality and an enviable dimension to the far reaching influence of his distinguished life. Our grateful memory of his Baha'i service is ineradicable. We ardently pray at the holy threshold for the progress of his radiant soul throughout the divine worlds. Kindly convey our loving sympathy to his dear wife, Lorraine. This was addressed to our National Spiritual Assembly, which Jim, um, and uh, the, uh, Judge Jim Nelson read it at the, at the memorial service. So if you have any questions, uh, I, I, this is my research can become a book <laughs> because I could not really do uh, justice to, to, you know, for half an hour. I, I don't know how long I've spoken, but anyway, uh, I do want to say one, one uh, last thing about, um, and this one I have not, I, I put this in my, there was a, a woman, um, a very, very dedicated to God and meditations. And uh, one day she was pouring her heart and during meditation and praying heart, with heart and sincerity. God noticed her and, and said to her, I will grant you one wish or question you may have because of your purity of your heart. And uh, so she's asking this question, God, how long more do I have to live? And he says, mm, 20 years. Oh, she's so happy. She's so happy. She gets out of her, you know, she makes a phone call to her plastic surgeon and she says, I want to have my face done. So, she goes to the hospital, has her face done. She removes all the wrinkles, etc. She looks beautiful. As she comes out of the hospital, crosses the street. Sure enough, she gets run by a car and she dies right there and then. Then she goes on the other side and she says, God, I thought you said I would have 20 years. God says, you know, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> so I, 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 so I hope
hope this has been um, <laughs> this been okay. <laughs> Any questions? Well, before question, Farah, I just want to thank you for sharing this love story with everybody. A couple of things I have to tell them about you. Uh, first, everything that Albor said is really true and even uh, so much more really. Uh, uh, those people that they have been attending this fireside, they know that I'm always looking for uh, somebody that has a courage to come and talk in this fireside really. And uh, when I talked and called uh, Farah for the fireside, she gave me several topics uh, but she mentioned also about Dizzy that she had been in their mother's house and things like that. I said, that is the topic. She said, I, want, I have to study. And this is the result of everything that she has done for this uh, fireside. Just for this fireside, I really admire and thank you so much, so much yeah. for your dedication and courage and really the enthusiasm and everything, everything that goes, I can explain all of that. But I have to also say that I was privileged in Washington DC some many, many years ago to hear Dizzy coming to Washington and it was interviewed in one of the station, the biggest station in Washington DC. And he, the guy said that he has to talk about Baha'i faith before he talks about his music. He was yeah. truly a brave man, God bless his soul. And I, all during your talk, I was really thinking that Dizzy is here, really, and really enjoying to hear that we all are really praising, really praising, admiring his courage, his dedication, and his faith, really, truly, truly. Uh, this is truly a blessing to talk about Dizzy in this fireside, and you made that possible. We thank you so much. Uh, now, I I, I, go ahead. I want to ask if, uh, 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 if uh, Dorothy Longo, is she with us? Yep, she's no? here. She's here? Yep, she's here. Hi, yes, I'm here. Oh, I, could you yeah, uh, speak to the friends just for a few minutes? Sure. About the stuff you said, please, to me. Okay. I, I just loved seeing, you know, hearing you. We had a uh, Alawa Pa friends. I am thank you for this this lovely lovely fireside and thank you Farah. Uh, we have Farah and I have um, have gotten to know each other a little bit over the past uh, several weeks as we were both preparing for this fireside. And I've got to say, my husband Mike Longo was Dizzy's pianist and musical director for nine years from 1966 to 1975. In fact, I wanted to mention that the, uh, the uh, video that you showed at the very beginning where Dizzy was playing with his quintet was in 1966. And that was right before Mike joined the band. Yeah. Mike joined in December of 66. But I also wanted to mention that um, the man who was playing the flute and the saxophone beside Dizzy on that video is James Moody and Moody yes, that's and right. he became a Baha'i also. That's he became right. a Baha'i actually right, it was after the World Congress. And uh, Moody declared, uh, I think at the end of 1992. But it, yes, that's Moody, yeah. And so Moody was Mike's brother and Dizzy was like Mike's father. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mike, and even after Mike left Dizzy full time in 1975, they remained very close friends uh, because we lived in Manhattan on the Upper West Side, which was very close to New Jersey. Uh, Dizzy lived in Inglewood, New Jersey, which is right across the bridge. And Mike would go over there all the time and uh, they would practice together and play chess together and hang out and Dizzy would also go down to his mother's and father's house in Florida, Mike's mother's and father's, and stay there and hang out. But um, Mike was, for a long time, the only 
white guy on Dizzy's band. And that was during the civil rights era. And so um, Mike passed away in March of 2020 from COVID. And so I'm in the process of writing his uh, biography, which is based on his memoirs. And a lot of that, of course, comes from his time with Dizzy. Um, and the working well, time. This, this the will be continued. You are going to come back here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, no, and, uh, just, uh, you know, what I want to ask you is if you would, uh, uh, the danger of life of Mike and Dizzy when uh, there was this uh, FBI and uh, for FBI and and uh, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, the yeah, for FBI. Black yeah. yeah. Well, but as they were traveling around, uh, they were, my, my, Dizzy was always concerned for Mike's safety, as were all the members of the band. And the band members uh, who were African American. Uh, all sort of protected Mike and Dizzy would want Mike to stay in a white motel, but Mike would never do it because he wanted to stay with the guys, of course, with the band. So it, there was one place which was in Pittsburgh, interestingly, it was in the north and it was early in Mike's period with uh, Dizzy and um, Mike was uh, surrounded on the stage by four FBI agents and four Black Panthers. And it was because there was so much racial tension that both the Blacks and the whites resented Mike being on the band. That's obviously right. for very different reasons. Yeah. And, um, and they stayed there while he played. I, they stayed there uh, while he played. So they surrounded him while he played and Mike, who also had an incredible sense of humor, he said, I said to myself, boy, if you ever played the blues, you better play him now. <laughs> uh, but I also wanted to mention that um, Mike, uh, Mike and Dizzy met Beth McKinty on the first night that Mike was with the band. That's right. There is something that is just so, I mean, I really feel the hand of God throughout all of this because I learned the faith from Mike. So really, I mean, I would not, I mean, it just, it, it all sort of just flows. And um, so the first night that Mike was on the band, Beth McKinty came and because Mike was, uh, Dizzy had some issues with driving. So Mike would always drive him around. And it came to be that Mike would basically be by Dizzy's side all the time. And mm -hmm. so uh, even that first night, uh, Dizzy came out after the show and Mike was right with him. And they both sat down at the table and Beth McKinty started to talk, you know, about Charlie Parker. And um, so, uh, and Mike and Dizzy declared at different times because Mike had been a Catholic and he declared and it took him like five years to declare it took Dizzy like, I don't know, maybe less than a year. But the other thing I wanted to mention is, um, Farrah, when you were talking, you said, you know, becoming a Baha'i is a process. And um, as I read Mike's memoirs about his time with Dizzy, I see how they both evolved spiritually. There was one time and I shared this with you, Farah, where um, Dizzy always, they were in a plane and Dizzy was always in first class and all of the band members were in coach. Yeah. And Mike and Dizzy were um, both reading the same Gleaning. passage from Gleanings. Yes. And I don't know what it was. Gleaning, but yeah. they were so excited about it that they ran to meet each other and they met in the middle of the plane. And they had the gleanings, both of them had the gleanings and they were jumping up and down and they said, Baha'u'llah really is who he says he is. Yeah. And the other thing that um, I wanted to mention was that when, uh, again, the process of becoming a Baha'i was much later, um, 
they had a like they became uh i don't know i don't want to use the word born again but they it, it sunk in at an even deeper level when dizzy um actually died and uh was brought back he was uh pronounced dead when he went to the hospital mm -hmm. and they were playing a club in new york and somebody slipped something into dizzy's drink and i don't know who it was i don't know why they did it i don't know if they were trying to be a joke no. No, Mike, Mike talks about it in, in this book, but on all Megan's, it was uh, 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 four gang members and he knew their names. Okay. They, yeah, I, I, I read about that, yeah. So That's let's talk about these things later because yeah, just no, finish the part that when he wakes Thank up you. from coma. Yeah, so, um, uh, so Dizzy, the, uh, after Dizzy passed out, the guys who had slipped him whatever they did, uh, started dragging him out the door and down the street and Mike saw them and he freaked out and he started to follow them and he said where are you going and they said we're taking him to the hospital and Mike knew they weren't taking him to the hospital so Mike ran after them and got dizzy and pulled him back and got him away from them and uh dizzy went to the hospital and he was declared dead on arrival but they brought revived him and when he came out of the coma um, and Mike at that time had not declared yet as a Baha'i. And so when, when, when Dizzy was uh, in such serious condition, Mike was with other Baha'is. He was with Roma Freeman, he was with um, Nancy Jordan and others. And, uh, and Mike was praying in his heart. He said, Lord, if you save Dizzy, I will become a Baha'i. And then Dizzy uh, came to and he was fine and then Dizzy, as soon as he came out of the coma, he said, he looked at Mike, because Mike was there, he looked at Mike and he said, I don't need anything but the Baha'i faith. Yeah. So those are stories I just wanted to leave you with. I also encourage uh, you to watch some of the YouTube um, on Dizzy Gillespie uh, when he was given interview. In fact, one of the interviews, the, the woman says, uh, but, uh, she doesn't say Baha'i faith and he corrects her and he says it's a Baha'i faith and uh, but always always he has stood and understood the 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 revelation of Baha'u'llah as being real and 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 highly respectful of it and he made sure yeah. other people respect it as well mm -hmm. so there are a few other uh, pictures if you want to show that and also I, there's a that U, UN, uh, UN concert that, well, it wasn't at United Nation, but he had a jam. Um, one thing that <laughs> I wanted to share one more story about Dizzy. He went to Cuba on a, on a boat. It was a ship or something, some sort of cruise. And uh, as they get off, the concert people, they get off the, the boat, there is a um, there's a man waiting, uh, and they think, well, he's, a, you know, someone who, who he doesn't speak very much English, and uh, he basically uh, uh, wants, to, wants to meet Dizzy Gillespie, and uh, he was a fan. So um, one of the other fellow, he spoke Spanish, and he asked him, you know, what he wanted, and he said, uh, I want to... Uh, 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 you know, uh, do whatever he wants, you know, Dizzy wants me to do. Uh, take him to, you know, I have a car and I can take him wherever he would like to, to go. <laughs> and <laughs> Dizzy and looks at him and, you know, but then he looks at the car and, <laughs> and boy, it was a jalopy 50, 51 <laughs> uh, car. And, but Dizzy, you know, he, he was always, you know, because of his, the fact that he was poor to the time of his wealth, he never forgot human needs and human kindness. He never forgot. And that's, I think, is one of the blessings of poverty is to, when you become rich, you know what it is like to be poor, you know? That is the greatest lesson I, when I was reading this. Through the whole time, he never uh, disconnected himself from anyone, whether he was in 
in some Afghanistan, with, you know, wearing these turban things. And in fact, and so anyway, this man was a musician and he had served three months in prison in Cuba because he was listening to the voice of America. And he loved uh, jazz uh, music, of course. He had read in the paper that Dizzy was coming. And so he went to meet him at the, uh, so Dizzy gets in the car and this jalopy, but Dizzy always wanted to go to a place where local people or poor people music. He was um, interested in the, in the folksy music. And so he takes him to all these different places and they all perform and he performs with them, et cetera, et cetera. But then later that night, he says, he, dis he realizes uh, that this guy uh, says, yes, he plays, he plays the trumpet. No, he plays the bass, but no. Uh, what was it he plays? Um, he plays, uh, uh, what do, well, anyway, he plays, uh, mm, well, so, Farah, can I can I step in here for a second here? And yes, uh, yes. I know we, we just have a couple more minutes in the evening. And I wanted oh, to ask, okay. we have you a couple- You guys are in the back east. We are just prime our time. <laughs> no, no worries. We just had a couple of questions in the chat. I wanted to see if we can touch on uh, before we wrap up here. Okay. Uh, the we'll first- another one for Daisy. Yeah. And there's certainly, you know, this is a gentleman that we could- we could certainly spend a lot of time speaking about yes, his incredible life uh, as as- you know, just from what you introduced this evening, along with uh, uh, Miss Dorothy, that there's clearly a rich history here for us to dive into. Uh, I wanted to uh, have us speak on a little bit or touch on a little bit the, 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 the relationship between Dizzy's music and his faith. Uh, we heard a lot about how he came to be a Baha'i or uh, as well as uh, the individuals that he interacted with in his music career uh, but in your interaction with him did he speak at all about how there is a relationship between his spirituality and his music did he touch on that subject at all very uh, much so in fact in all the books he talks about progressive revelation and even if you hear the youtube some of the youtube i think i listened 10 or 15 hours of youtube his music his talk etc and for past two, three weeks. He says, uh, progressive revelation in religion is progressive, like, you know, Adam, Buddha, Krishna, Mo Moses, Muhammad, I mean, uh, uh, Christ, Muhammad, Baha'u'llah, is progressive. And he says, music is also progressive. And he called it progressive revelation in music as well. Amazing, and I know that- for, Especially, for especially, the jazz, the jazz music, he said, is progressive. Is that one place? In fact, it, could you play that part at the United Nations, or is that um, is it too late to do that? Me personally, my saxophone is right over here, so I, I can't get it out this evening. But, <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, you no, need to play Dizzy's. Dizzy's. Oh no, no. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I guess I can do that. Beautiful. Yeah. In fact. Uh, Mike uh, Longo is uh, is in it, uh, and, uh, and of course Dizzy and all his band, and then and then um, this uh, woman. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, why am I? In, uh, I'm just blank on names, but I'm, Dizzy would never be blank on names. I mean, he you know snap snap, he would say it all. But this woman who was on the plane with him, she of course became she was. Just absolutely, Fiona. Uh, she um, she uh, she is in 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 this YouTube uh, section that I sent to you. He had Brazil. He has samba. He has all these different music put together with American jazz. And uh, you know, if I could just very briefly address the uh, spirituality uh, and music that you had asked about. Um, there's definitely. Uh, uh, a connection and a parallel. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Mike always said, because Mike had also played classical music, and he said that um, Dizzy in the musical evolution realm was a messenger. He mm -hmm. said that in Dizzy, with Dizzy came the first organic change in music since mm -hmm. Bach. 
And Mike also said that he learned everything he knew from Dizzy, but he never learned everything that Dizzy knew. And I do know, I remember Dizzy talking about, he said, you never create music. He said, you discover it. He said, it's out there in the universe. You just need to pick mm. up, p- put your hand up there and grab it. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's really good seeing each and every one of you. I recognize my dear friend, Don. Thank you so much for uh, introducing me to uh, Dorothy. And uh, she is really, a, I hope that her books comes out very soon. And I probably will start writing a book about this myself because of the research. It is so wonderful. But I highly recommend this book. So, um, uh, can you see? Yep, it looks it's like a... Donald Megan's. Donald okay. Megan's book is called The Life and Times of John Burke Gillespie. <coughs> As you can I see... Think Shireen had her hand up. Okay. Shireen Magami. Yep, we're you're, on, just, you're on mute. Serena, I just want to bring your attention. We have uh, just a few more minutes Sorry. in this evening. I here. wanted to know what year was that when he came to your mother's house and declared. Oh, it, uh, it was in, yes, it was in uh, 1968. That's when Mr. Samangari was uh, traveling from yeah. Chicago to. Uh, all, the different states, and then he, when he went to Alaska, um, uh, he he had pneumonia. But then he he went to Seattle, and in fact, you uh, always hear uh, this actor uh, who played in the Office. Uh, 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 what's Rain Wilson? Rain Wilson. He he used to come to our feast at our home, and he had spoken about the fact that he was just a little infant. And Mr. Samandari held him in his arm <laughs> when he was in Seattle. He was staying at the, his, uh, um, at their home. You know something about Mr. Samandari? He was um, very frug- very um, frugal with money. He would never wanted to spend. Um, so he always stayed with uh, people's home, different friends who had homes, and provided. And he in restaurants he would never order food. He would maybe put some ketchup in the wa- hot water and mix it into a soup and then drink, you know, eat it. <laughs> but he just was very, very conservative. He would just, because he was um, uh, sponsored by the Guardian you know, on his travel. And so, but then of course in 68, he was traveling under uh, the direction of Universal House of Justice. Thank you so much for sharing those stories this evening. Yeah. And thank you, Shireen, for. For Thank you. I have another question. What about his family? Are they still involved in the faith? This is family. I do not yes. know. I didn't do that. No. no. It sounds like. But it you sounds- know, I, I do want to say that this is taught the faith to so many people. My daughter went to a school in, in, in Los Angeles. And there were a lot of movie stars and, and musicians and, and they're uh, like, uh, uh, what's that, Quincy Jones. One day I asked him, his daughter was in school. I said, uh, have you heard of Baha'i? He said, of course I have. I said, how did you hear it? He says, Dizzy Gillespie, you know, they were p- performing together. Um, Titus Jackson, who was brother of Michael Jackson, they also had heard of the Baha'i as well, but not from Dizzy, but from other musicians. I think probably Seals and Crofts. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. B, do we have any closing thoughts? Yes, uh, Corey, are you here? Yes, he is. Could you have the, the closing prayer, please, Corey? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> From the sweet scented streams of thine eternity, give me to drink, O my God, and of the fruits of the tree of thy being, enable me to taste, O my hope. From the crystal springs of thy love, suffer me to quaff, O my glory, and beneath the shadow of thine everlasting providence, let me abide, O my light. Within the meadows of thy nearness, before thy presence, make me able to roam, O my beloved, 
and at the right hand of the throne of thy mercy seat me, O my desire. From the fragrant breezes of thy joy, let a breath pass over me, O my goal, and into the heights of the paradise of thy reality, let me gain admission, O my adored one. To the melodies of the dove of thy oneness, suffer me to hearken, O resplendent one, mm. and through the spirit of thy power and thy might, quicken me, O my provider. In the spirit of thy love, keep me steadfast, O my succorer, and in the path of thy good pleasure, keep firm my steps, O my maker. Within the garden of thine immortality, before thy countenance, let me abide forever, O thou who art merciful unto me, and unto the seat of thy glory establish me, O thou who art my possessor. To the heaven of thy loving kindness, lift me up, O my quickener, and unto the day star of thy guidance, lead me, O thou my attractor. For the revelations of thine invisible spirit, summon me to be present, O thou who art my origin and my highest wish, and unto the essence of the fragrance of thy beauty, which thou wilt manifest, cause me to return, O thou who art my God. Potent art thou to do what pleaseth thee. Thou art verily the most exalted, the all-glorious, the all-highest. Did you know this? Uh, this uh, this put into a cla uh, music, this prayer. It is so beautiful, mm -hmm. and it was put in music by. Uh, he was a House of Justice member, uh, the father of Sheila Banani. Um, isn't that funny? I can't remember his name right now. Mr. Nachtavani. No, father. She loved oh. only, or is not Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, he was a musician for the studio and uh, very well known musician. He, many of the mm -hmm. movie scores have been uh, made by all good. We appreciate your time this evening, uh, Farah. We, we uh, welcome to have you back again, and uh, it's so. You know, it's it's a lot of times during these firesides we talk about spiritual concepts, and so it's so nice to take the the kind of obtuse and make it very precise and see the journey of somebody that has learned about the faith and then been able to implement those principles in his life. So, thank you so much for bringing those to us this evening. All right, uh, are you going to be showing that uh, that uh, YouTube uh, section a little bit? Yep. Or? Yep. So. Uh, exactly. So uh, for, those of the, uh, for those of you that have joined us before, you'll recognize the time in which we ask everybody to unmute themselves and say hello and goodbye. What I will do to modify our evening's program is I will share my screen here for just a few short minutes, and then uh, I'll play the music on a very low volume. So as we say hello and goodbye, we can also be entertained by Mr. Dizzy Gillespie. So with that being said... Kendry, this is good to see you, Kendry. Good to see you. <coughs> now they can hear you. <laughs> Saying goodbye and hello and all that. So if you want to talk. And for those that uh, are interested in hearing this, this is an hour and a half. No, no, not the whole of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We're not going to listen to the whole thing, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in the chat here for those that would like to listen to this in their entirety as they fall asleep this evening you can go ahead you can put this on your computer your ipod or whatever you have she's became a baha'i also yeah and i'm gonna 